I, I live in the matrix of choose your battles. Mm. And so in my interaction with law enforcement, I would never let them be mean to me. Say that again and explain, please. I would never let them be mean to me. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an example. Please. I'm driving across 57th Street in New York at 12 midnight in a convertible Rolls Royce mm -hmm. that has no tags on it. And the you're a black man. Did you know the, you was a black man when you did that? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh -huh. the, the, the cops roll up on me. Okay. And when they, I saw the car behind me, you know, following. Welcome to 365 Brothers, the podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Robin Shine, and get ready for another episode where I introduce you to another amazing, interesting, intriguing, and inspiring African-American man from the United States. They come from a variety of professions, various parts of this nation, and all of them bring their wisdom. So chill out, relax, listen in. Make sure you follow us. We're on Instagram at 365 Brothers. Also, you can go to 365brothers.com backslash Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R-E-E, -E, 365 Brothers backslash Linktree. You'll find links to all things 365 Brothers, as well as links to anything Robin Shine. Again, thank you and Let's listen in. Today, we have the privilege of speaking to a thought leader. He is a contribution to the success of people all over the world. But in particular, he also has an interest in sparking and growing the success of African-Americans. And who is he? Well, he's a retired attorney. After retiring from practicing law for many years, he has a full-time writing and speaking career. He has numerous books out there. He's the author of How to Make Money in Music, The 12 Universal Laws of Success, and one of his more recent books, Solving the Race Issue. He studied under Dr. Frederick Eicherin Coulter, and he also became the director of the Science of Living Institute in New York City former national marketing director with the NSA, and Herbert is a much sought after marketing and wealth building expert. So where did he start all this? Well, he graduated from Columbia University in New York City. His knowledge pursuits have taken him all over the world and have helped him relate to audiences of all ages, all cultural backgrounds, and all educational levels. I've already mentioned his name when I said Dr. Herbert Harris, that is exactly who we are talking with today. So Dr. Harris, first, I just want to thank you for being here and sharing some of this knowledge. I was just telling you that I just finished reading through Solving the Race Issue. I was on my way back in the airport and it was a perfect read. Um, I got some new things out of it, which we'll get into later. Um, but before we go into our questions, is there anything that you'd like to share with the listeners to help them get to know you better? Well, you know, Robin, thank you so much for having me on the program. And, you know, I, I'm at a point in my life where it's never too late. I've retired at least twice. As I spoke today at the Unity Church, and I speak at the Unity Church in Wilmington once a month. And one of the things I've been really focusing on is to let people know it's never too late mm -hmm. to do whatever you want to do. It's never too late to follow your dreams. It's never too late to study extra, to put in the extra time, to do some of those things that can give you a, a higher skill level and a higher level of consciousness mm -hmm. that will permit you to attract greater things into your life. So one of the things we've been focusing on lately is home study courses and online training. And okay. we have a the new you for the new year home study course. Okay. And it gives a person a chance to really look at themselves, assess where they are right now, develop a, a means to address some of the changes uh, that they need to make, and then set new goals, and then how to keep going and growing. A lot of our information is on our uh, link tree, and okay. that's at www.herbertharris.info. 
okay. and plug in with some of the things we're doing. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get started. First question, Dr. Harris. What is a favorite song or movie, either now or all time? Well, I tell you, I was super impressed with the Black Panther movie. Mm. Often young children would ask, you know, where the black superheroes are? Are all the superheroes only white? And so Black Panther took it to a whole nother level and established for black kids and for kids around the world that they are superheroes of color and that they're depicted in the movies. And it was well done. You know, that was the other thing. You know, so many times you will have great uh, producers, great film people, but the budget just makes them have to make those kind of compromises that can impact the quality. So uh, that to me is one of the greatest films that I've ever seen and that I really, really like for those reasons. Yes, yes, agreed. You know, we will often come out to support a movie that we are featured in where we are the main characters. We'll do that. But the way we came out for Black Panther was really because it was an exceptional movie, period, as did the rest of the world based on the, you know, the money. It was just exceptional. And the the way that they depicted so many varieties of us, right, Mm -hmm. and us in power. So that was that was pretty awesome. Thank you for that. I love that movie too, as you yeah. can tell. Um, well, you know, what, well, you know, when you ahead. think about Black Panther, you rarely hear the dollar statistics, right? But, you know, and you know, on a worldwide, one of the things that I think that they downplayed was on a worldwide level. This is one of the biggest openings ever, mm-hmm. <laughs> and even in America. And and think about this, you know, the number of screens is still controlled by the system. And so I'm sure that there could have been more screens available. And believe me, it would have filled every screen. So I I just want to always be aware of that. If someone ever really documented the numbers and gave put it on an even keel with the release of some of the other major blockbuster films, that movie would probably be a runaway bestseller. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk about words. You're a major author, a major thinker. What? is your favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book? Well, my favorite book is the Bible. When the first time I read the Bible, I had calculated it, and I needed to read 13 pages a day in order to read it in 90 days. Okay. And when I actually read it a lot, I started that journey. I'd actually gone to the Holy Land, gone to Israel, because Mm -hmm. I wanted to see the biblical ge- geography. Yes. And so I was able to travel through Israel and Jericho and the Sea of Galilee and yes. use that almost as a tour guide for the Bible. And so that gave me a different perspective. And then after my studies there and then studying with Dr. Frederick Eicher and Coder is better known as Reverend Ike. And the reason is because his name is Frederick J. Eicher and Coder and nobody can pronounce it. Right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but uh, Reverend Ike was, uh, you know, people had different opinions about him. But from a, a spiritual point of view, he was a great metaphysical teacher. And so when I started really studying the Bible, it was to study it from a spiritual metaphysical point of view, not a John said this and a Mary said that and this is sin and that is sin. But to right. look at the principles Every person in the body represents a principle. Every parable, every story, there's a, there are different levels of meaning to it. And so I spend much of my time really getting more into that, understanding it, and being in a meditative state, receiving more instruction, more enlightenment on that. I actually, from time to time, I teach in uh, one of the Bible colleges mm-hmm. on um, leadership principles in the Bible. So mm-hmm. that is my like constant text. There are tons of other books. I'm a reader. I was, I try to read at least a book a month, mm. but the Bible is always that book that I go back as I speak to reaffirm, you know, scriptures. Sometimes a new interpretation will come seeing scripture in a different light. So that's yes. my, my number one bestseller. Um, I talked a little bit about in the introduction, I shared a little bit of your journey here. I actually want to ask about that moment when you knew that you wanted to leave the practice of law behind and start speaking 
and writing full time. What inspired that? Things develop concurrently. It's important when ideas come to you to act on them. As a self-taught person, I'm always in the learning mode. Okay. And so after studying and really getting to what you might call uh, personal growth, personal development, spiritual development, one morning in my meditation, I was in New York and I had a vision that said, you know, like, I want to teach. You know, I feel like I'm learning this stuff and I really would like to teach it. I got up to go jogging that morning. I was living up near City College. I'm jogging down Convent Avenue. I run into Dr. Maddie Cook. Only time I ever ran into her walking. And she was the president of Malcolm King College, which was located in the same building where my law office was, the Teresa Towers, 125th and 7th. I said, Dr. Cook, she said, hey, Attorney Harris, how are you? I said, you know, I want to teach a course on personal development. She said, what's it called? And out of the blue, this this topic came, achievement motivation. And she said, I love it. Can you come into my office today? I want to learn more. I'm like, today? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so four o'clock, I'm in her office. She loves it. And b- between that time, I sort of put some ideas together, what I thought I wanted to do. And she said, beautiful, let's do it. Start Monday. And so there's some spiritual principles here. Number one, the moment an idea comes to you, act on it. Okay. In the Bible, it talks about when uh, Moses is being challenged by God to go tell Pharaoh, to let his people go. Moses was like all of us. He started making excuses. You know, I stutter. I could down, you know, I, I'm not the one. Okay. And this is what I mean. Whether there was a Moses, who he was and what he looked like, I don't know if that's really relevant, but it's the principle involved that says when you are confronted with a challenge of greatness, that there's a part of you that says, not me. <laughs> oh, no, Lord, not me. I am not Speak the on one. It. Speak <laughs> on it. <laughs> okay. You know, and Moses started looking for excuses. He said, oh, I stutter. You know, I don't know what to say. Who will I say sent me? And basically God said, tell him I am sent you. I am is the making power. And mm-hmm. just open your mouth and I will speak. Your mm-hmm. brother can talk. Let him do the talking. So, mm-hmm. And so. That was an application. That's why I'm talking about putting spiritual law in action. That was an application. So when Dr. Cook said, yes, I'm going to know about it, that programmed my mind. Now I have to have something to say at four (laughs) o'clock. Okay. So it's like going to the well. If you don't have a reason to go to the well, you don't go. And so it doesn't matter whether there's water there or not. But if you have a thirst and there's a reason to go to that well, then that water is going to be there. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when I started to teach that class, I didn't think that the other books were totally adequate, not because they weren't good books, but because the students that I had were, you might say, non-traditional. Many of them had been out into the world and had some legal issues and now were getting back on track, had married and had kids, wanted to get back on track. Some of them had been in the military. And so it was a different type of student. You know, you weren't coming out of high school, you know, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. OK, gotcha. and so I had to develop a set of notes pulling from all the great texts that they could use. And so that began my evolution of writing. Those notes began to evolve as I ch- taught the course there and taught it at other schools. It began to evolve into a newspaper column, mm. which then evolved as I collected the columns into an early version of the book called Thoughts for Success. And so it was not that I just one day said, I'm going to switch. But as I was developing this perspective, Mm -hmm. when I got an opportunity, you see, one of the things we talk about in the 12 universal laws of success is in the law of value is the importance of solving the riddle of survival. And that means that until we solve the riddle of survival, we basically live in hand to mouth. We're eating and we're making just enough money to to be around the next day to eat again. When you solve the riddle of survival, you accumulate enough money in a business and your savings. However, you accumulate enough money that your money, your investments can take care of you at the level that you're comfortable. And now you have the most valuable gift that God gives 
to each of us. Let me let me see if I can guess it. Is it time? Time. I knew That's it. it. That's <laughs> it. And so the essence of life is just time as God's gift to man, mm. to mine. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and what we do with the time based on our choices and actions is our gift to God. Mic drop. Oh, I, I, I literally got a chill when you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. When I was speaking today at the church that was rolling out and I could tell the audience was like almost mesmerized. You know? Yeah. No, that's and, that's juicy. Yes. And so uh, I was very blessed to come to a point where I could sell my business and I came into a, a bunch of money. You know, we always talk about entrepreneurship yes. and as black people, we have to get away from one generation of businesses, getting away from riding a business until it goes into the ground so to sell it to sell your business yeah and move on and so the end result was you know what i want to make a new life i want to make a new start i've done all that i can do in in the law area yeah and i said i want to follow my dreams mm -hmm. and see that there's some keys to identifying your goals many times we follow goals that may not be our own. Yeah. You know, in, in, in the 12 universal laws of success, we talk about chapter seven, the law of action, how to set your goals. And, you know, it's basically all of your goal setting books say your goals must be smart and smart yeah. S, they must be specific. M, they must be measurable. Yeah. A, they must be set in advance. R, they must be realistic based on where you are. T, they must cover a certain time period. Mm hmm. But I say the types of goals that will cause you to transform your life are those emotional goals. Goals like what do you enjoy doing? Mm -hmm. What are you good at? <laughs> Look, see, we could go all day. I won't even get to the rest of the questions. So I got to jump in, just say a few go things. Ahead. I know my listeners be like, maybe like, you ain't got to jump in, but I, I am <laughs> going to. <laughs> go ahead. So, you know, I knew it was time that was going to be be that. Um, and by the way, I am looking forward to reading next because I just finished the solving the race issue. So my next is the 12 universal laws of success because I'm enrolled just through our conversation and I've read a ton of them, but I know that you bring something unique to it and every book is unique. And so I'm looking forward to that. But I know because, you know, I'm about six years from retirement, more or less, you know, and and so I put everything in order because of beautiful people like yourself who came before me and who put out their books about how to plan for your retirement, what to put away, things like that. And be, what I have noticed is the reason that I have the time to do the podcast, to continue to grow my art, my artistry as a doodler is because those things are handled. Right. And so that that personal experience. And so you know, I just encourage people to do exactly what you're saying, you know, get Dr. Harris's 12 universal laws for success. However you do it, read, study, grow, because that last thing you said, which I'm going to ask you to say it again, because it was so brilliant. Yes. Yes. Time is God's gift to us. And what we do with that time through our choices and our actions is our gift to God. Just it's juicy. It's brilliant. It's awesome. You know, you're fully accomplished. Which accomplishment is the one that means the most to you personally, Herbert? And then which accomplishment is the one that when others hear about it, it's the one that most impresses others? And you got many. So let's start with the first. Which one is the one that means the most to you? Writing the second book meant the most to me. Which one was the second again? The 12 Universal Laws of Success. Well, the, it was really the third, but writing the 12 Universal Laws of Success was the one that we're most proud of. The first book that we wrote was called How to Make Money in Music. And that was written in a different vibration. I had a, a co-writer, Lucian Farrar, and we actually got an advance. We wrote three chapters and an outline. And we had an agent. We got an advance. 
Okay. Nice. And and this is in the days when brothers didn't get advances. We got right. One. It's still hard to get yeah. an advance. Yeah. And and so we wrote that almost like a job. Mm. <laughs> okay. Because we knew we had money at the end of the line. Uh, the deal was done in March, and we wanted to have the book finished by the end of the year. And we understood the advanced cycle where it said, well, you know, we better get this final manuscript into them before the 1st of December. So because yeah. it takes them two or three weeks and then you go into the holidays so we can get that check <laughs> before yes. the end of the year. So that was that was driving us the structure, the, the, like you say, the treadmill. OK, mm -hmm. the 12 universal laws of success was different because we had solved the riddle of survival. I had left New York. I was living in Cleveland. And the main thing then was the discipline to do it. There was no prospect of selling it. Nobody had any money waiting at the end of the line. It was just to do it. Mm -hmm. And to learn then the discipline of writing. Every Many people want to write a book. Say, well, what's the secret? The secret is discipline. I may not have brilliant ideas every day, but I can choose that gift to God I can choose to sit at my desk from 9 to 12 a.m., mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. 9 to 12 noon, and say, I will not move, and I will write. Just the fact that I'm sitting there, you know, like, you know, when you as a writer, you know, that blank page looks at you and calls you all kind of dirty names. It says, I ain't, you ain't writing nothing here. And every time you write something, you cross it off, okay? But sitting there is priming the pump. And so when you sit there, God determines that now you're worthy. And so now to become a conduit. So writing that, the 12 universal laws of success, I was a conduit. Mm -hmm. I was dutiful. I was obedient. Mm -hmm. And then I let the words come through me. Yes. yes. And so that was, that's why that was the, the, the accomplishment I'm most proud of, because that was that when that internal understanding of go to the well prime the pump and be disciplined to get to get the flow as the flow comes through God. As someone who's written, it's such a dance. What I hear in that accomplishment for you about the second book versus the first, because you said you're a conduit, right? And we do participate in artistry, whether it's writing music, playing music, being a, you know, a painter, whatever, we do participate and we make some choices, but it really is a dance, a balance of letting something that wants to be there flow through. And what I hear is with that second book, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm good with being wrong, because I, I, I want to say too much to never be wrong. <laughs> but I hear in that, that in that second book, you got to discover your relationship to what you were producing and that you work together with the it that was becoming. And uh, isn't it joyous? Now you tell me if I'm wrong. Well, absolutely. It's the alignment, mm, you know, it's the alignment. And once you recognize the well has infinite potential. This and Sunday, he's preaching, y'all. Y'all <laughs> gonna hear it on Monday, but it's Sunday and he's preaching. <laughs> The, the well of life has infinite potential, but it gives you what you put into it. In other words, it, someone once said, you come to the ocean with a cup. <laughs> the ocean is more water than you can see, and you come to get a cup full. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> so with, with the well, whatever your level of consciousness, that's what the well gives. Yeah. You know and what's so funny about that? And this at this in my 50s, because I don't mind saying that um, I have noticed now that I was feeling all big, like, you know, broad shouldered and stepped up because I don't go to the ocean with a cup. I go with a bucket mm -hmm. <laughs> and only to realize, you know, you just go with a bucket, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. It's the next yes. generation. But yes. it's like, okay, that's great for you. Pat yourself on the back. Now look again. Is uh -huh. that really it? That's all you want. That's all you want? Okay. 
<laughs> so yeah, I, I, mm, I love it. And what about the accomplishment that impresses others most? Which one is that? Well, people are very much impressed. I have a wide range of knowledge. Mm. And I have a, a photographic me- memory. Okay. I'm periodically out of film. Okay. Mm. But, <laughs> but people are, are most impressed. The, any topic you can come up with pretty much, I know something about. Mm-hmm. And being a conduit now, the moment you accept that, 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 that relationship, and see, being a conduit is a relationship with the source. Mm-hmm. Example, a person may say, well, what do you know about physics? And the first reaction, most people, I don't know anything about physics. So my next question is, if you did know something about physics, what would it be? So we just changed the paradigm now. So now instead of the thought being, I don't know, it's like, if I did know. So that's priming the universal pump. If I did know, well, I know about the laws of physics. I know about Isaac Newton. I know about gravity. And and it begins to pour out of you. Mm -hmm. So most people are impressed by that, my ability to discuss anything pretty much intelligently and to bring humor to it. And yeah, so that has served me all my life. That has that has gotten me out of trouble. That is that has helped me in confrontations with policemen. It, 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 that that ability has been a divine gift. Mm. I hear you. Though to be honest, what you just described are my favorite people on the planet. The people who are inherently curious and incessantly engaged. Those people are always reading, observing, how what, whatever is their means. And sometimes it's not people who love to read, it's people who love to listen, or it's just people who observe everything about hum, human nature. Mm-hmm. But they can bring something to every conversation. And then you add that humor, and it's like, you just want to hang out with these people. So I now want to talk about significant moments. What is a significant person, moment, conversation, or event that either change the trajectory of your life or had a significant impact on your life? Well, Reverend Ike changed the trajectory of my life because when I worked for him, I was the head of the Science of Living Institute and a good friend, a confidant. But he showed me that that law was not where it was at for me. Mm. Okay, And I saw then that you can create a whole world from the things you love doing. You know, a lot of times we are so afraid of going broke, of losing our material possessions. There are very few of us that can do like Tyler Perry and sleep in his car, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, until he until he made it. Most mm-hmm. of us sort of cling to like, man, I got to keep this going. Mm-hmm. I got to keep a job. And so mm-hmm. we, we don't we don't break away. And so Reverend Ike was very instrumental in, in showing me that, hey, if this is your heart, if this is the desire of your heart, then if you're not get good at it, get good at it mm-hmm. and then do it. Mm-hmm. I love that got you to seize your trajectory yes. to say, this is my time, my life, my allotment. And mm-hmm. what do I really want to do with it? Because what yes. I really want to do with it is this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What accomplishments are there without our health? Last season, I interviewed Dr. Gregory Hall, and this brother has done extensive research on the nutritional needs of African Americans. He created sequence vitamins. They are specifically designed to address the deficiencies that lead to some of the preventable diseases that affect us in the Black community more than others, things like diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease. So I've got a link in the show notes. Please check out his vitamins. I've been taking them for three months. I bought them the day I interviewed him because I was so impressed and I am loving how I feel. So again, I want to recommend you check out Sequence Vitamins and Because I love them so much and because he is one of our 365 brothers, you get a discount. So check it out. Just click the link you'll find in the show notes. 
have you had any interactions with law enforcement? And, you know, one or two that stand out for you, whatever their, you know, whatever the energy of it. Yes, I have. I've had interactions with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And, but I come from the era, the civil rights era, where your parents taught you how to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Your mama told you, like, don't run from the police. Okay. Mm -hmm. When the police ask you something, you be nice. You be respectful. Mm -hmm. You watch your mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And coming from that head, whenever cops would inter- when interact with me, and there are times when I've had confrontations with cops, mm-hmm. but I have chosen, it's all about choice. I have chosen to live in the matrix of personal protection mm-hmm. so that I can then be there for the important battles. I, I live in the matrix of choose your battles. Mm-hmm. And so in my interaction with law enforcement, I would never let them be mean to me. I'm sorry. Say that again and explain, please. I would never let them be mean to me. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an example. Please. I'm driving across 57th Street in New York at 12 midnight in a convertible Rolls Royce mm-hmm. that has no tags on it. Okay. Uh-oh. And you're a black man. Did you know you was a black man when you did that? (laughs) Yes. Okay. Uh The the, the cops roll up on me. Okay. And when they, I saw the car behind me, you know, following. And because the the top was down. Of course. Yes. I understood that right away. (laughs) Well, by the time, between the time they saw me and I got one block, there were like three cops in front of me. When the cop came up to the car, he didn't have his gun drawn, but he had his hand on the gun. I've seen that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he said, license and registration. I said, man, I am glad to see you guys. And <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, listen, you can't see my face if it, on audio. I'm like, say what? <laughs> That's what he did, too. I said, I am so glad to see you guys. I said, I was involved with the show at the Coliseum there on 59th Street. We were, had a car show there. This car was on display. And they had to get the car out of the place because a new display is coming in. And the Rolls Royce people are closed. When I finally reached them by phone, they told me to bring the car over and put it in the garage. There's a garage beneath the Rolls Royce dealer on 57th Street. Uh-huh. And the cop looked at me. I said, so, man, I am so glad you guys showed up. Do you know, at that point, he didn't even say, well, give me the license and registration. (laughs) They led me over to the place. (laughs) That's going to sound harsh on the audio. Sorry, (laughs) (laughs) y'all. And and so that's the kind of thing, you know, when the cops stop me, now, I always drive luxury cars. They see a brother. In a luxury car. Yeah, we've heard. We know this story. We know how this rolls. But I choose to play the role of suited and booted. If I'm traveling on a plane, I'm always suited and booted. All right. I always, I do not travel in jogging suits, anything. I travel in shirt and tie. Okay. Okay. Because it changes the interaction. You see, everybody's infected by these different paradigms. The issue is, is that right? Should a black man have to do that? Uh-uh. It's not shouldn't right. Have shouldn't right. have to. Okay. Right. But you choose your battles. Uh-huh. I choose not to fight that one. So I'm like, I come in suited and booted. So you get treated completely differently. Yeah. So many things happen because of cars. Uh-huh. I come across the Whitestone Bridge. I come through the toll booth. Next thing I know, cops are pulling me over. I'm like, now what did I do? So suited and booted. And I say, wow, officer, is everything all right? Not, why did you stop me? Is everything all right, officer? He said, no. What? (laughs) He said, you got, you driving here with no lights on. That's why we pulled you over. This nighttime, you got no lights on. And I said, for real? He said, you didn't know you didn't have your lights on? I'm like, no. And he looked at me and I'm suited and booted. Yeah. he said, Reverend, you've been driving those luxury cars too often. In these 
in these rental cars, you have to turn the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how did he know to call you Reverend? Had he asked for a... Because a black man in a suit to a white man is a reverend. Oh, don't you dare tell me that. Don't you tell me. Don't. Oh, come on now. On all my traveling, like I say, I always travel suited and booted. For the company that I work with, I do network marketing training. So twice a month, I'm on the, on the road, flying somewhere. And in 12 years of working with this company, no white man has ever said, you look like a CEO. They always come up and they say, Reverend, are you, you're a minister? Nobody's ever said, are you a CEO? But that's the paradigm. See, everybody's sick. We just have different sicknesses. White people are sick. They see a black man in a suit and tie, they automatically go to minister because that's the paradigm of racism. That, And I won't say they bought into it. It's yeah. just there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to jump in. Just, just touch my foot in the water of your book, Solving the Race Issue. I've read the lynch letter before. That, that chapter stood out for me. Even though I'd rather, I feel like how you laid it out and what you brought into the discussion about it offered me something new. And I'll tell you what I took away from it as it's relevant to this and the perception like being called reverend, right? When you say everybody's got a sickness, when I was reading about the lynch letter and they talk about, which I've known the, that, um, you know, the slave owners would have sex with some because they needed to create that variation in color yeah. so that they could have house errs and you know yeah. field ones and also the lynch letter setting up the constant jealousies the constant who's better so that no one trusts each other like i think mm -hmm. that's what you brought to it in mm -hmm. terms of what you expanded on that in the past you know yeah it's right there you see it he says it mm -hmm. But the way you expanded on about the not trusting and having us mm -hmm. always be looking over our shoulder and giving a little side eye to anybody that's mm -hmm. doing something we ain't doing. But what I got from it that was new was, as you explained it, like I really had not appreciated that that extends to whites in the mm -hmm. sense that just as we talk about how we will judge color less so now. And I'm thankful for that much less. So you don't hear that as much because we've gotten away from the field in mm -hmm. the house. Right. Well, I want to be careful when I say this. I don't want to come off sounding stupid. <laughs> it's not like I didn't know that powers that be, what those who actually run the country are, you know, keeping that tension between black and white. Because if we work together, there's actually more of us that have something in common, right? Mm -hmm. But that they keep whites looking suspiciously at blacks. And then blacks are unable to trust white Americans, that that exists. But what was new was seeing the bird's eye view of the constancy that that it cannot go any other way to maintain the power to maintain the structure of this country blacks and whites cannot get along it will not be allowed to happen because mm -hmm. if we come together then we might actually exercise our our right to vote if not our right to protest our rights to our you know god given rights as human beings to demand an actual living of life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm going to tell you, I had a criticism about your book at first. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. my criticism was the title is Solving the Race Issue, right? So I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading. I get to the mm -hmm. end. I'm like, you ain't, where's the solution? You ain't said nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said solving, but you got no solution written here mm -hmm. until I was thinking about it and what you shared. And I was like, oh, if you've been reading and you paid attention, the solution is right there. Free your mind, baby. Free your mind. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And the spiritual law, you know, America, basically, most of us are hypocrites. Okay. Mm. And many people who practice religion are hypocritical. And what I say is this, for example, the second commandment is treat your brothers you would like to be treated. Okay. If that commandment was followed, then most of the things that happen in the world, the nasty things would never happen. Ain't that true? Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we have all these terrible things happening means that we're basically hypocrites. We read those words, but they're not in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about the, the solution to the, the issue of race is a spiritual solution. 
Mm -hmm. So you always have these contradictions going on and there's right. spiritual contradictions. And so until those contradictions are resolved, the first acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And we can see the country now is going in the exact opposite direction. Once you acknowledge it, you got to ask forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's the, the recognition of the golden rule. I have mm -hmm. sinned against you. Please forgive me. I have treated yeah. you like you are not a human being. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing, you must make recompense. You must make everybody whole. Yeah. People interpret it as reparations, but reparations is like the shadow. It's much bigger than that. Until that spiritual dilemma is resolved, America will always be in this divided, fractured nation. I mean, at this point, we're at the point where the very democracy is being threatened. Isn't that the truth, that there are some who are willing to toss away this great experiment in order to avoid having equality, mm -hmm. right? I, there are so many tangents, ways, places we could go on that. But since we are in this conversation about the nation, if the United States was a woman with whom you could speak, whether she's a mother, lover, stranger, neighbor, friend, your choice, if the United States was a woman, Dr. Harris, what would you say to her? That's an interesting question. And the first thing I would say to her is, let's be honest with each other. Any type of interaction, when we talk about the different levels of communication, the different to, to communicate with a person is to establish a vibration between you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my first question is, let us be honest with each other and let us be committed to tell the truth. Mm. And like that it. right there is pretty much the deal breaker. <laughs> because based on what we were saying before, but I would say, let us be committed to tell the truth. If you are willing to fess up and tell the truth and to acknowledge who you are, what you are, mm -hmm. then we can, we can go forward. Right. I get that. Moving into this next question, uh, a more, another gendered question. Beyond the generalities and stereotypes, um, what is one thing that you wish all females, sisters, daughters, cousins, wives, mothers, knew about the Black male experience? What, what's, what do you wish women could get, know, understand? That's a profound question. Um, we all live in different matrices, matrices in, 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 in clothes and other matrices. The male paradigm is to not show hurt, mm -hmm. to not show pain, to not show weakness. Mm -hmm. And so if a woman understands that okay, and can now help a man resolve that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so if a woman can understand that so many times there's, there's a lot of pain in men that they don't even acknowledge, they don't even recognize, they don't even know it's there. And that if you can draw that pain out mm -hmm. so that they can, you can share that pain. Because then what you're really doing is you're helping the man be who he was intended to be mm -hmm. as opposed to who he has been defined to be. With us all living in the matrix, this is the white men, when they see me, they think I'm a minister. Mm -hmm. Black men have similar paradigms mm -hmm. that the matrix has imposed. So, so black men don't try. You gotta, mm -hmm. and, and, and then when we look at some of the music, some of the conversation about how men refer to women, mm -hmm. the derogatory terms, and you know, some of the terms where how women refer to themselves or permit themselves to be referred to. Mm -hmm. there, there's so much stuff going on there. So if a woman can at least understand that level of pain in a man, not to permit abuse or to be taken advantage of, but just to be able to understand. So many times you can't do anything about it. And it's just man say, hey, I understand your pain, brother. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know the details of it. And if you ever want to share it with me, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know too many brothers that could fight behind that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't even know how to say mean, nasty words behind that. Mm-hmm. And so that's just just one of the things, and to, to understand that. Then also, then to, I think, men are not taught boundaries. They the the essence of maleness in this paradigm is not taught boundaries, and so I think it's that important that women develop establish and insist upon boundaries Mm. Mm -hmm. not be so wanting to be i mean most of us don't want to be alone Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so to be truthful about what a man really says i don't care how much you love this man if he's not if he's not committed to change and not committed just lip service but taking steps to change he's not going to change And so you mm-hmm. have to create the boundaries like, hey, mm-hmm. mm. you saying so much right there because it goes back to that being truthful. Right. Because on the one hand, you know, we want that person who has thrown the first stone or who has done his wrong or her wrong to own up. But, you know, in this response, you're also inviting the other person to own, be accountable for their role. So it's because it, what flashed in my mind is, yes, it's easy to say, you know, you said you're going to be faithful and now you're cheating. And you said you're going to do this and then you did. You said, you said, you said, mm-hmm. except for one little thing. All the evidence was there from day one, from day one. And you're going, and and I love that you said being desperate, needing to want somebody, because really, you know, it's so funny you're saying this, because truly the, the article I was working on um, was about this point, which is that desperation to have someone, right? It 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 is used as an excuse to put on blinders. Mm-hmm until it gets too painful. And then you want to act like there was nothing to have seen until this moment. Mm -hmm. And so I I just appreciate what you're saying about that. Um, But I'm also appreciative of what you said before that about being cognizant of the pain that brothers experience. You know, I appreciate that you're inviting women to not ignore what we know and in the not ignoring, not pretending we don't know, mm-hmm. there's this opportunity to be a vessel for healing. And I, I say at the end, if anyone listens to the very end of my you know, ending um, music and whatnot on the show, the last thing I say is to listen is to love. Like that, mm-hmm. is, that, is, that is what this is about. To listen is to love. And I hear that in what you shared about the pain. It's like, you may not have a solution and nobody asked you to fix it, mm-hmm. <laughs> but could you listen? Could you yes. be willing to not pretend that our black men are not human mm-hmm. and as humans experience pain like everybody else? Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, it, it really resonates with me what you wish women knew. And, you know, and I ask questions in a gendered way, but really don't, uh, you know, don't, don't get it twisted. I mean, every human person <laughs> should right. know that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the next question is about a moment for you that exemplified being powerful. What was one of those first moments or one of the moments that really stand out where you were like, oh, hey, now, so this is what it is to be powerful. You know, it's in law, there's that time when you win the case that you weren't supposed to win. When you win the case just because you worked at it, and you said, you realize that it's all about creating a vision. Mm. The people believe what they think they see. Mm. Yeah. And so to once you recognize that you have that power, then now you can move through life now being able to create the vision necessary for you to survive and thrive. So for you, was it that moment? Was it a winning of a case? It was a winning of a case because I had a, I was very insecure 
for example, at the time, I even thought that the, the, that my voice was too light. Mm. You know, I have one of those kind of ambiguous voices, people say. I've changed it a bit, but I felt when I would go into court, I felt I had to change my voice and I had to say, good morning, Your Honor. This is Herbert Harris of uh, Pope Bill of Sneed and Harris, and I stand before you today to speak about things I know absolutely nothing about. But to say it in such with such authority that people, you know, even if I said it like that, if I said those very words, but with the authority with which I said it, they would not have heard what I really said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they would in their mind have heard that man knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and you, cause I can, let me, let me, let me demonstrate. I am here today because I'm here to share about a case of which I know nothing about. <laughs> You, you get that in there, and now they're like, oh, 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 she's trying to play with us. Oh, she knows everything. She's just tricking us. <laughs> so once you realize you have that power, then any situation that comes to you, I'm driving my car to Raleigh to pick up my daughter. I pull into a gas station. There's a bunch of Trump guys, Trump signs and everything, and I got on my mask. And the fellow sees my car. First, he didn't like the car. It was a nice car. Uh And they're looking and they're saying things. I can hear them back and forth. So he said, hey, man, I don't know why you wear a mask. This is a hoax. (laughs) And at that moment, there's about six guys on this truck. They probably got guns and all this kind of stuff. Uh Let me give them a picture they can buy into. So I said, I hear what you're saying. I said, but I'm a senior citizen with a young wife, and I'd be damned if I'm going to die from this COVID and let that young woman get all my money. (laughs) (laughs) And I already know they were like, amen, brother. Amen, Amen, brother. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) If you need another one, we got some. (laughs) uh, Low key, we got some in the glove compartment. So, you know, if if you need anything, and take care of that girl. <laughs> okay, yeah. See? And so once you realize you have that power, mm. Mm. then you can move through the earth, with a, as they say, with the greatest of ease. You have a skill that I have been learning over time from my best friend because he does it naturally. And there's a phrase that's used. I, I've taken a lot of landmark courses and one of the things they talk about is get in the other person's world, right? Mm-hmm. That if you want to connect, get in their world. So what I hear is when the police stopped you, mm-hmm. you're like, let me get in your world. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. so glad you stopped me. <laughs> you, you're over there. You're not in your world. You're in theirs. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then same with these, uh, with the Trump supporters, uh-huh. who, you know, want to gold you with you know, using the mask as something as something <laughs> legit they could get in your business with, uh-huh. right? And then you're like, let me get in their world. Okay. Uh-huh. You want to keep the money from your girl, I already know. <laughs> Same here. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> and so I I applaud how and earlier you did in fact say that that's a gift, like that you acknowledge it's a gift. Yes. I'm very aware of my best friend. I mean he just charming witty boom boom. It, it it it's like you wondered did he stay up all night? Except there was no way he could have stayed up all night to come up with that comeback because he couldn't have seen it coming, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it is something that we can all learn mm-hmm. over time. I don't. I doubt I'll ever be as good as him. I don't know that I could ever be as good as you. But we can you, all get a little bit better about you, being but, over there. But you can be as good as you need to be, and that's all yeah. that's important. <laughs> You just dropping them left and right. We know you preach on Sunday. <laughs> you, you can be as good as you need to be. Okay, right on that. So speaking of good, let me ask you, if you could spend five hours with any other Black man, whether he's living or moved on, passed on, who would it be? And either what would you do or what would you talk about or both? The number of Black men, the obvious men, but there was a fellow named Emmett McHenry. Okay. Never heard of him. I know you I haven't. Have probably. Yeah. Uh-uh. Emmett McHenry was the black man who basically developed the whole nomenclature 
for the dot-com world. Really? Yes. Emmett McHenry was an engineer. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, he had a company called Network Solution. Wait a second. My first several website business attempts <laughs> were on Network Solutions. Yes, that was his company. Get and out he, of here. I never knew that. Yeah, and he had a contract with the federal government to list all, to catalog domain names. Uh-huh. But the contract would only pay him a million dollars a year, which was fine in the early 90s because domain names hadn't really come about. But as that began to get bigger, the contract was a losing deal. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he wanted, they needed to go to Congress and uh, the copyright, you know, there was all kind of legal, but he wanted the permission to charge per name and they wouldn't grant it. Okay. And, and he sold the company. You know, you'll see the thing called I can. Yes. Yeah. He sold network solutions to I can for, I think five, a little over $5 million. Okay. And, and within a short time, all of a sudden, Congress changed its mind and those in power changed their mind so that they could then charge per name. Get and the out rest of is here. history. Yeah. Get out of here. Emmett McHenry. Go on Wikipedia. I'd like to say I have actually talked with him and I wanted to know how you feel when that happens. There are very few people. I don't know anybody else that can explain that to me, how you feel, whether I'll ever be confronted with that opportunity. I don't know if you want to call it an opportunity. Yeah. But with that situation, but how does it feel? You know, when you have, and he didn't develop it overnight. He developed it over years. When yeah. you get to a point that you are so boxed in that you have no alternative. It's like you have, you have this child and you yeah. have no alternative but to sell the child into adoption. Thank you for your answer. The first internet company that I bought a website from was Network Solutions, and I was a customer of theirs for years. And my guess would be that um, I probably started after he sold it, um, because oh, yeah. I know that, as a matter of fact, because I was buying domain names, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I went yeah. to them. And so what I'm hearing you say is, they were a no on having this be a money-making venture until that black man sold it. And now, oh yeah, no, actually that makes sense. Yeah, okay, sure. Make as much money as you like. Mm -hmm. and, right. and again, some people might listen and go, well, you're just speculating there. There could be a lot of reasons. Well, you know what? You can go look them up. <laughs> That's yeah, my speculation. I stand by my yeah. speculation. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you for answering all these questions. Do you want to give your yes. uh, website yes. address? Yes, my website, our link tree that takes us to all of our stuff is www.herbertharris.info, H-E-R-B-E-R-T-H-A-R-R-I-S.info. Our Instagram is dr.herbertharris, and our Facebook is facebook.com, dr.herbertharris. Our email is herbert at herbertharris.com. And I'd love to get emails because I like to get questions from people about oh, the wonderful. things that are bothering them. A lot of times, you know, when, when a person feels the need to write a question, write, send an email and I'd say, hey, this is what's happening in my life. There's mm -hmm. something about the harmonic universe that if it's happening to this person, it's happening to a thousand others in different places. Yep. And yep. so herbert at herbertharris.com. Very generous. That's wonderful. And all of these will be included in the show notes, or at least they should be. <laughs> so they'll, you'll be able to find them, audience. You guys know I put that stuff in there for you. I'll close by just asking you, um, the last two, two little bits are, um, what did you get, Herbert, for yourself out of participating in this conversation? Well, number one, I got an opportunity to really converse with a very brilliant, very creative person. And there's nothing like what we did today was a, a harmonic relationship between you and I. Mm -hmm. And so all the good stuff that whatever was created, it's something that we did collectively. Mm -hmm. I am better because of you and you are better because of me. 
Yes. So that is my takeaway from it. And it says spend time with people who are value, people who have that sensitivity, people who are on the move. You know, once again, that time is that gift. And so Mm -hmm. the time that we've spent together has been my gift to God, because Mm -hmm. I think that together we have shared some information that can heal people, that can help people, that can uplift them. Wonderfully said. Um, And it, it really is a privilege to interact with all the brothers. And this has for sure been no exception. This has just been an amazing conversation uh, for me. I've, like I said, I've got tons of things. I got sands. I could decorate my whole room with Herbertisms, Dr. Harrisisms, you know, <laughs> and um, right back at you uh, in terms of you being a brilliant human being. And, you know, people forget that brilliant. We just say it like, oh, he's brilliant. But brilliant refers to shining brightly. It refers to sharing light and Mm. sharing that light so brightly that darkness stands no chance. And so that is who you are for me is brilliance. And what you've done with this, with your books, with your speaking, with your conversations, is you are bringing light to the world. So thank you, the brilliant Dr. Herbert Harris. Thank you, my, my lady. My honor to be with you, always knowing that the best is yet to come. Remember, you can follow us on Instagram at 365 Brothers. Also, follow us on Facebook at 365 Brothers, the podcast. Lastly, I just want to let you know, producing a podcast, it takes something. And I'm really grateful to have partnered with Alidu.com. They make publishing easy. There's a link in the show notes for anyone who either has a podcast or is thinking about a podcast. You don't need to learn all that sound balancing and compression. Save all that. Use your time for what matters, interviewing and sharing the stories that your podcast brings. Thank you for listening to 365 Brothers. Certainly hope you enjoyed the episode. I encourage you to subscribe. Please leave a review. I want to know what you think. Also, if you know someone who would be a fantastic guest for 365 Brothers, please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. And your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love. Always knowing that the best is yet to come.